Uh, but I want to welcome everybody to the uh, USC Dialogue Series. We're calling it this year. It has been the Road to the White House 2012. And for those of you who are new to this uh, joint effort uh, today, this is a joint effort of the Dornsythe Jesse M. Unruh Institute of Politics, the Annenberg Center on Communications and Leadership and Policy, and the Judith and John Bedrosian Center on Governance and the Public Enterprise at the Saul Price School of Public Policy. Uh, I'm Dan Masmanian. I'm director of the Bedrosian Center. And I am pleased to uh, welcome all of you and to introduce our panel and our topic today. Uh, let me just say first about the topic, which is China from a US perspective. Uh, as I uh, shared with Professor Hickela, who I'm going to introduce in just a moment, intriguingly enough, at least my watching of the campaign on the road to the White House so far this year, we haven't heard much about our relationship with China. And the really important issues involving US and China, basically uh, under which the, it, we're in the shadow of those issues every day, but we're not talking about them yet in the campaign. And they have to do everything with trade, with environmental quality, you know, with power, uh, military power, with expansion of uh, China and possibly the contraction of the United States hegemony globally, all critical issues, which will be affecting all of us and we would think would be part of the dialogue of the campaign. I also would like to suggest that now that uh, Santorum is out of the campaign, that Mitt Romney, the, the major Republican now candidate is probably going to engage now more directly President Obama in these kinds of issues. So this may be an interesting backdrop to what we're going to see as the campaign moves forward. That is from looking at the domestic social issues to the really more profound and longer term issues facing our society for which this panel is going to shed some light. So I want to begin just simply by introducing Professor Eric Hickela. He's a, one of our professors in the school of uh, the Saul Price School of Public Policy. He's an economist by training with a focus on planning, with extensive publications, including a book called The Economics of Planning. Uh, as co-founder and ex executive secretary of the Pacific Rim Council on Urban Development, Professor Hickela has been instrumental, really, for a number of years for our university and our school in particular in developing and maintaining a strong international network of scholars and practitioners who are involved in urban development throughout the Pacific Rim. He's to be complimented for his diligence in this area on all of our behalves. And as a recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship, he spent an academic year with Beijing's University Department of Urban Environmental Studies, where he undertook joint research on urbanization in China. And as I recall, now seven years ago, he hosted me and several others on the faculty on a trip to Beijing in China. Eric, I want to turn it over to you to introduce our students and lead in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear? Is this all? Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, thank you, Professor Masmanian, for, for the introduction, and thank all of you for coming. I agree with Professor Masmanian's uh, uh, comments that thus far, we haven't heard so much about China in the presidential election campaign. I suspect that that will change over time, but we, we shall see. However, um, putting the campaign aside, I note that increasingly we do hear people talking about China. Uh, it's coming up sort of ubiquitously. It comes up all the time uh, in, the, in the news. And one of the things that um, uh, we see is that China is often uh, portrayed as a kind of competitor. We kind of talk about it in terms of how it's affecting uh, U.S. jobs, U.S. economy, the environment, and other issues. And indeed, that's uh, what we've been looking at uh, this semester, uh, those of us who are seated here, all of us are participating in a class that is that is just 
nearing its conclusion now, so the timing is very good for this. We're participating in a graduate course on uh, China from a U.S. policy perspective. And so uh, the three, the three uh, young folks who are here with me are all graduate students here at USC who are students in this class, and a number of others in the room here I see are also uh, students in the class, and I'm very happy that they're able to join us as well. And uh, so they are from, from my left here, uh, Caroline Kim and Lu Yang Liu and Joshua Harris. Uh, Joshua and Caroline are both uh, Master of Public Administration students uh, here at the USC Price School. Uh, Lu Yang Liu is uh, studying her master's degree in economics here at USC. Uh, they're, I think, representative of the, kind of the, the, the broader pool of students that we, that we have in the class, and I ask them if they would, would join and help uh, sort of uh, join in the issues, and they're kind of, I think, in, in, in many ways representative of the, of the kinds of discussions that we've had in class. So I'd like to begin by, well, first of all, telling you what we've done, just very briefly, some week, each week, uh, we've, we've looked at a different departmental perspective. So beginning with the Department of Agriculture and then moving to the Department of, uh, of Commerce and looking at the, Dep the Treasury Department, the Labor Department, the uh, Department of Defense and Health and Human Services and uh, uh, HUD and looking uh, from, from all of these different departmental perspectives. Each week, we take a look at what is the policy agenda of the federal department as represented by that cabinet, uh, that cabinet post, and how does the rise of China impact upon that policy agenda? And so it's, this is the first time this class has been offered, and I think for all of us it's been quite a learning experience, a rich source of materials looking at uh, both what the department does and how the rise of China intersects with that. And so yesterday, in anticipation of this event, the, the class as a whole, we, uh, we, we stopped and took stock of much of what, of what we've been doing, because in a way we've been diving into the, to the trees and we wanted to step back a little bit and view the forest, the contours of the, of the forest as a whole. And our, our assessment was that a, a number of the issues in which China the rise of China sort of comes into the fore in terms of U.S. policy. Many of them have to do with, of course, the impacts that that has on the quality of life of, of American citizens, those living and working in the United States. And that can be through at a personal level, through uh, issues of and at a national level and at a global level. So things such as climate change, ranging or but increasingly things like focus on jobs, energy, uh, the the uh, trade trade imbalance, not just with respect to jobs, but things like uh, macroeconomic uh, imbalances, are things that come up repeatedly. A second sort of trench of issues that come up in the context of the rise of China have to do with kind of the operational or transactional uh, facets of this relationship, because China and the U.S. are very different in many ways. They're, they have very different cultures, they have very different levels of economic development, they have very different histories. There's a very different kind of ethos and kind of ideological basis on which the, the, the governance structures are founded. And with all of that comes differences in terms of what we mean and how we, how we address the world. So things like standards of food safety or of, or of professional certification and, uh, and, and so many ways of how we look at the world. So just how we sort of communicate with each other and what we understand to be common reference points in order to deal with these broader issues is something that, that uh, the U.S. government spends quite a bit of time with. How do we, certif how do we certify food safety when we're importing uh, food into the United States? And how do we define what is a criminal if we're talking about, uh, if we're talking about extradition treaties that we might have in place? 
place. And so, so these kinds of definitions and standards um, are part of the, the, the meat of, or the day-to-day the -day, uh, grist of, of how we manage the transaction. And so what we found was that a lot of the focus of the US government departments on this are dealing with these very practical kinds of issues. And then, of course, there is the broad contextual approach. We're looking at uh, a lot of the dialogue about US-China, the China's rise in the world and how it affects the US has to do with, partly has to do with the US position in the world. And uh, is the US uh, losing its leading role in the world? And are there alternative paradigms of development and of global engagement that, that are being put forward? And is it, in fact, a multipolar world? And if so, what is, how can the US work with other countries such as China? And is China a, a competitor or is it, is it, is is it an ally? Is it a rival? Uh, is it all of the above? And how do we sort that out? And what does it mean for our transactions? So our take on the readings yesterday was, was really, as we assessed it, we distilled it into those three. And I'd like to end my brief comments with our kind of sense of what does this mean for how the US might best engage with China. And this isn't to try to second guess what the campaign for the White House is going to do, but more is our sense from, from, our, from our investigation of these issues, our sense of what is the most positive way forward. And I would begin with a single word, and that is energy. It was a revelation to me, and I think to many of us in the class, how often issues of energy security came up in different contexts when we're looking at the economy, when we're looking at military issues, when we're looking at climate change, when we're looking, of course, at energy supply. That energy, we, we determined, was, was a really kind of crucial point of engagement, and there's an opportunity to make that engagement a positive one or to make it one that is more uh, rivalrous. And so we think that there's a, it's, it's very important actually because the US-China relationship is very important. It's, it, is also, it is therefore essential that we look for ways to build on where there is a true and genuine joint interest. And energy is one of these where, the, where expanding the supply of energy, essentially shifting the supply curve to the right is going to benefit all of us, right? So it's not a rivalry question. If we can work together, for example, through uh, the uh, deployment of science and technology and other means to find ways to effectively move, shift the supply curve for energy resources to the right, that's going to benefit China and the US in equal proportions because we're all dealing with these markets. Likewise, protocols for how we uh, engage with energy supplies around the world, because part of our reading showed us as well that, for example, when, we're, when we were reading Department of Defense-related works, a lot of those defense um, works, especially in the context of China, had to do with securing energy supplies. Of course, that's nothing new. The US role in the Middle East has, in many ways, been viewed through the lens of energy security. But as we look at China's growth, um, the, the, any projection, even conservative projections of China's energy growth are, are frightening to contemplate in terms of the, this shifting of the demand curve, which surely is going to mean rising energy prices. One thing then in the context of the election is to, make, is to, is to have that understood. So ways that we can work together on protocols for securing new supplies and on, on um, enhancing supply can have other benefits because there may be macroeconomic benefits as China, for example, draws on technologies available in the US to, for example, produce, uh, take their, their coal supplies and provide cleaner ways of, of generating energy supplies from coal using US technology. That can help address some of the macroeconomic imbalances that uh, plague our relationship. Uh, the role 
of educational exchange. We already have many uh, wonderful students here from China. Many of our students here from USC uh, go to China, in, in including through U classes that we offer here. And so there are ways to look for this kind of construction engage, constructive engagement, and that's what we would like to put forward into this debate. It's very good as a start us now. Where do you want to go now with the questions in particular? Well, I thought that uh, in particular the, the, the uh, students might like to elaborate okay. briefly on that, and then we could perhaps uh, just jointly explore where there might be opportunities to, to really uh, advance, advance an agenda and put it, put it on the plate, as, uh, as, especially in this election year. Yeah. Okay, I guess I'll start. Hi, uh, my name is Caroline. Um, a research interest of mine in the past couple of years has been um, just how China is really challenging the international aid architecture. And I think this is something that has really escaped the policy lens in the United States. Um, it's something that has been on the rise and it's actually been in existence for a very long time now. But I really do think that it's something that is going to change the geopolitical um, climate um, with regard to how the U.S. can now um, become uh, influential in areas where we're currently not that influential. So I'll start with just a few remarks about, since we are talking about the road to the White House, um, you know, what do voters think about China? What are we as Americans thinking um, with regard to China's rise as a global power? Um, there was a major study done by the BBC. Um, it was administered first in 2005 and again as a poll in 2011. And it was assessing just the climate of voters not just in the U.S. but all over the world about their opinion of a rising China. Since 2005, we've seen an exponential increase in the negative opinion about how people perceive China's rise as a military power and as an economic power. I think this is something that's very significant because for voters, when we think about um, policy, we might not be focusing so much on China currently because we're very concerned about our domestic politics and economics. But this is something that does um, inter that we interact with every day. So if you wanted to look up that study, you could type in BBC poll, um, China's rise to power, and you would be able to find it. Um, having said that, I think what we're really discussing here is how China is currently trying to balance and sort of toe the line between these two different states that it's currently in. First, um, we have China trying to balance its rise as a status as a global power. Um, we see that they're trying to maneuver and sort of um, sort of wield power in certain areas, and we see that particularly with regard to trade policy and energy policy, like Dr. Hekula has mentioned. China has been able to achieve a lot of its national interests and in some ways be able to coerce other states to comply with some of its interests um, more effectively now than it did a few <coughs> years ago. Um, and then uh, on the other side of that coin, we see that China still is trying to strategically leverage um, its status as an emerging economy. We see this with regard to environmental policy, where China still categorizes itself as a developing country and is allowed to um, have a certain level of emissions so that it can continue to grow economically. Um, and we also see this in the context of um, aid allocation. China is often able to strike a relationship, like a South-South type of partnership, with developing countries and they're able to say, hey, you know, we're a developing country, you're a developing country, we can really help each other out. And it really becomes a discussion of mutual benefit, which is something that's markedly different from the way that the U.S. allocates its aid. So I think it's just um, how the U.S. can help moderate this role that China is trying to play on both sides of this coin. And I think China really does have um, some strategic and very critical choices it needs to make in the next few years with regard to how it's going to wield its power and how it can um, transition itself out of that emerging country um, status to more of a global power. Caroline, you've raised a number of issues, and, and I'd love to myself ask questions, but I'm going to resist, uh, and I'm sure others will too, because it's not only its foreign aid policy, but your notion of it's the changing perception of China, and that is a backdrop to this campaign in the future, and I, it's curious how candidates may exploit that in an unfortunate way as opposed to the way Professor Hickler was suggesting, which is how do we find a positive path forward. But with that said, I want to turn to Liu Yang maybe possibly next and some comments. Yeah, I think um, uh, Caroline raised a very good question about the changing image of China because, I mean, um, for, let me say, like uh, like 50, 50 years ago, maybe when you mentioned China, the Americans said, okay, that's a, 
uh, some American parents will tell their children, okay, say so you need to eat this because the <laughs> children in China are starving now. So this is American parents' perception of China like 50 years ago. And I, I mean, remember. <laughs> Me yeah, too. <laughs> and I mean, yeah. like for the current parents will say, hey, you cannot eat uh, uh, this, uh, you cannot eat this because it's made, 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 made in China and it made in poison. <laughs> so so the, in the current, I mean, in the current, the parents of the United States maybe, I mean, translate made in China to what's hot. Uh, and maybe, I mean, for our generation, so I think the perception of China will be totally changed because you see for each of us, we inter interact with Chinese students every day. And in, as you I see, we offer so many courses about China to enable the, our generation to critically think what China it is. What is real China? It's not, I mean, it's not a, a country, is it a country full of starving kids or is a country that make millions of poisonous <laughs> food? I mean, yeah, so for my generation, I really hope that uh, young people in the United States and also young people in China can think critically, what is the real China? And what we really hope for, what is the US-China relationship that we hope, that we wish. Yeah. Joshua. I think coming in November on the I campaign trail. Pull up mic in front of you. Yeah. I think coming in November on the campaign trail, something that's bound to come up is the national debt, which comes up routinely and has about the last 30 years. How that relates to China is that they are a significant holder of our national debt. We have about $10.8 trillion in publicly held debt and there's 15 trillion total that's held by the, the government, um, by Social Security and the Medicare Trust Fund. So 10.8 of that is public, meaning it's, it's uh, privately held by other people. China holds 1.2 to 1.3 trillion of that, and which means that they're about one eighth of, of our national debt. That's what they hold, um, which is kind of concerning to have one party hold that much control over our debt, meaning if they wanted to sell off significant portions because they thought that the U.S. dollar was less valuable or perhaps they just wanted to do it to prove a point that they had some leverage over us, that could be very concerning to a lot of people in Washington. Um, so I think in, in the fall, something that's going to come up is how we need to tackle the national debt. It's a pressing issue. It's been a pressing issue for a long time. It's right around, you know, 14, 15 trillion dollars, which it's a trillion is hard to fathom. That's hard to fathom. Uh, one concept I, I use to, to think of it often is that if you were to put a one million dollars in a bank account the day Jesus Christ was born and add in, in a non-interest bank account and add um, one million dollars every day until today, you'd only have 700 million. So you're well short of one trillion and we're in the hole for 14 trillion. So this to me is something that's gonna be a big issue well into the future. And China has a big role in that. These are all having to do with, with both cultural perception and economics, but, but uh, the, the comment was made also about environment, and I'm curious what your class thinks about, and it's related to energy. You mentioned energy, uh, just a little factoid, that the Chinese still are opening one coal-burning uh, uh, electrical plant every week, uh, which is contributing to the, to the reason China now is the single largest emitter of, of the greenhouse gases on the planet. They've surpassed the United States, did so about four years ago. Uh, not that we're pristine in this, we are second. Um, but, but how is the class thinking about this as an issue of, of, you mentioned co cooperation, but also competition and global antagonism that both our nations are causing? Anybody? Yes. Um, I mean, I actually think that this is an area that is uh, really interesting because it doesn't affect just China. No. Um, for example, um, like I said, my research interest has been how China is involved currently in Africa. China has an almost insatiable need for natural resources. So when we're talking about impacts on environment and we're talking about you know the building of and expanding of large industries, we're also talking about a lot of um, extractive industries. Um, China does not have the capacity to um, 
uh, fulfill all of its natural resource needs, which is why it's expanding at a very, very fast rate into other regions of the world, particularly in the most resource-rich regions, which is Africa. Um, with regard to debt, I mean, China currently holds a huge proportion of African debt. Um, they're investing large projects into infrastructure as well as extractive industries to be able to take out these resources that they need to continue growing their industries um, back within China. And I think um, with your question with regard to the environment, we're talking about not just impacts on environment within China, we're also talking about impacts on environment in other regions of the world. And this is something that we have not yet thought about and how that relates back to the United States is that, I don't know if people know that um, 15 to 18% of oil imports into the US actually come from Africa. Um, and that's a larger proportion than what people would think. The reason for this is that um, the chemical composition of oil in Africa is very unique in the sense that when refiners take it, it's actually easier to refine um, oils from different regions of the world because China, um, African oil tends to be lighter and is, it helps in the refinement process. As resource need grows, as energy needs grows in the, U, in the United States, we are going to need to really think strategically about where we're going to get these resources. I really feel that Africa is one of these regions of the world we have not yet thought about. Um, it's not been publicized in policy yet, but if China is investing all of its money into developing the oil industries in Africa, they're nationalizing these industries, they own these industries, then what does that mean for the United States? Um, so there's environmental implications as well as implications for energy policy and just geopolitical considerations. We're being crowded out. So I think this is actually a point of contention and competition. Others, go ahead. Y yes, I'd, um, can some of the comments here earlier, as Joshua was mentioning the importance of the national debt, uh, and also just in the context here of the democratic process we have in the United States, uh, I, I like to use a simple analogy, and although it's a fairly simple analogy, my, my sense is that it actually captures some of the essence of the problem fairly well, and that is of a kind of a shopkeeper that uh, imagine I'm, I'm, I'm a customer and imagine that Lu Yang is a shopkeeper who happens to be Chinese here. And um, so I go to her and I, and I buy goods from her shop with IOUs that I write. And so she's got a stockpile of these IOUs and I've got um, uh, consumption well beyond what I could manage if I weren't, if she didn't accept my IOUs. And so in some ways we're both happy, we're both getting what we want, right? I'm, I'm getting to consume more than I actually produce uh, and more than I can actually afford. Um, and so I'm, in a sense, able to live beyond my means by virtue of the credit that these IOUs have. She's doing well in the sense that she's got this pile of IOUs that represent wealth because a bond is uh, nothing but actually a promise to pay. You know the expression, uh, my word is my bond. Uh, that, that actually is exactly true, right? The bond is nothing more than a promise. So she's wealthy because the, there, is, there is a market, in fact, for these IOUs that I give her. But we've seen in the context of Europe, a developed country that developing, very much part of the developing world, that, that we are not immune to, to markets uh, at some point deciding, well, I'm not so sure if I want to keep buying all of those promises because we don't see uh, the, the capacity to actually pay back. And in fact, we, don't, we, we see structural conditions in place that show that, uh, that, that we're, we're not in a position to do so. And I think this is very important for us to recognize that in it, us here in the United States, especially at a time of an election, because you know, I do spend a lot of time elsewhere in the world looking at different systems, including China, and it does make me ponder about the role of democracy as it's exercised here in the United States. And a conclusion I keep coming back to again and again and again is in the, in that, you know, democracy is 
uh, a kind of political system that is full of promise and it has it has you know it's anchored in something you know very solid which is the voice of the people but it requires responsibility on the part of those of us who exercise this franchise to vote and that if we if we allow ourselves to be persuaded that uh, we can continue uh, to, in a sense, consume beyond our means, and that we, then, in a sense, we deserve the the rude awakening that's coming. So, it, and that in turn always brings me back to the the very valuable role of education. It's one of the reasons I feel you know uh, eager to come into work every day. Is I do feel that the that this kind of exercise, and I, I do, I, I do compliment the Bedrosian Center on. On, on raising this, not just in the context of China, but a whole range of issues that are that, that we're facing at election time, that that the real onus is on us, the, and so I think it that means that the onus in, on us is not to allow potential political leaders to get into office by pointing to someone else and saying China is the reason that we have this deficit. Uh, it's part of the whole package, but if we don't look at ourselves and if we don't address our own issues, if then then we're in trouble, and the democracy is is as well. So that's why I have uh, I think this kind of forum is very important. You actually move us into this. I think it's time to turn to the questions and comments from the audience. But but may I take the liberty of just asking? So given what Professor Hickel had just mentioned, and the question that Joshua raised about the deficit, uh, not only being held by China but its scale and size, uh, and I heard something about being responsible citizens. I'm not quite sure what that means, but mm -hmm. but I. Think I think that means I consume less. I'm not sure. So how many of you are willing to voluntarily consume less on behalf of the national deficit? <laughs> I mean, I think we have a we have a conundrum. Well, it'll will. but it will happen. See, I, this, I is, this is this is right. It's, 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 it's whether we're responsibly. Yes, right. It's difficult to do when it comes down to well, then what do I have to forego? Uh, what are you asking of me? And it gets translated in a political arena to that question, despite the. The, the, the other things that are going to go on. Could I just use one small sure, example? Sure. You go ahead. Then we're going to turn it open to yes. the audience. Just one small example to provoke. I mean, a good example of that is energy prices. This is extremely unpopular even for me to say here, but I'm not running for office. Uh, but if I were running for office, it would never work. But having a five or six dollar per gallon uh, energy price could in fact be the foundation of a lot of the solutions for the problems that we're addressing. But try to get into the White House running on that platform. On that, let's open it to questions. And, and when you do, please just give us your name. And do we have any, I don't see any mics. So project, please, your voice. My name is Julia Capizzi. I'm at Soul Price as well. And my question is for Dr. Hecula. Um, could you clarify what you meant when you said finding ways to shift energy reserves to the right? Just shift the supply curve. I guess I'm sort of. Yeah. So if we have a He's supply, an economist, remember. yeah. So I can take for granted. But the the supply curve essentially tells us for a given price how much quantity is forthcoming. So so the idea is that when by shifting a supply curve to the right, what we're doing is making more uh, resort resources available at any given price. And one way to do that is through technologies. So if we have more advanced technologies for drilling or for uh, accessing uh, hard to reach energy resources, that's an example of shifting the, the supply curve to the right. There's a question back here. Go ahead, I didn't see it, but where'd you, where were you pointing, Eric? Uh, to this gentleman. Junior at Marshall, uh, this is also for the professor. Um, Professor, you mentioned sort of a gas tax and a four to five dollar, or maybe five to six dollar price of a gallon of oil. Um, I mean, a gallon of gas. Sorry. Um, don't you think Professor, President Obama is sort of incorporating that by not running on, on that platform, but incorporating increased cafe standards and sort of, you know, um, making us sort of be more efficient in our consumption via more efficient technologies and not more expensive gasoline? That is actually. Uh, moving the demand curve to the left, which is also very helpful, also has the same beneficial uh, effect on on prices. 
actually, I have a comment about that as well. There's, um, where the U.S. has actually just filed suit against China um, with regard to China's new um, quota policy on exportation of rare earths. Um, why that's important to this discussion is that rare earths are absolutely necessary to expand certain technologies, particularly with um, you know clean burning energy cars. Um, any kind of science, um, you know, research and development endeavors do require um, a lot of them with regard to energy do require rare earth minerals, and I think that this is again a case where we really need to think strategically because we are trying to expand different ways of finding. Um, you know, efficient sources of energy and to shift, like uh, Dr. Hecula said, shift that demand curve um, so that there's less demand for certain types of energy. But we really do need to collaborate with China on that front because, you know, qu quotas on that kind of um, mineral is definitely going to hurt our ability to invest in those types of technologies. To speak to what you brought up, um, I've actually, in the last couple in of the years, mic, uh, over the last couple of years, I've actually seen several studies that uh, suggest that by increasing in efficiency of the use of uh, energy, it actually causes people to use more. So it, it doesn't always, like total usage actually goes up because people think it's cheaper or it's more efficient and I can use, I can use more and more of it and actually just drives its use up rather than actually curtailing people's consumption of it. Good question. Over here. Um, the discussion, uh, David Gasser, I'm a PhD student at the Price School. So the discussion so far has focused mostly on economic questions or uh, questions that kind of um, appeal to kind of the sense of rationality. But there's kind of an elephant in the room here in that China has a form of government that goes against American values. And, and that has been uh, the source of much of the US negative perception of China, and the last several times we've been engaged with countries that have governments that we don't care for, it's usually led to military escalation, and um, some people would argue that the U.S. has won, and those forms of government have been defeated, whether it's in Russia or in parts of the Middle East. So, what makes you think that uh, it's going to be different with China? Um, you know, why why isn't the U.S. just going to use this as the next? Um, impetus for military escalation and defense rather than economic engagement. I think, I think the difference between what's happening in the past and what's going on now goes back to the national debt. They hold one eighth of it. So we're not likely to start a fight with someone like that. And it's not in their interest to be in conflict with us either because uh, it hurts. They, we're up the number one consumer of what they export. So clearly there's going to be a hard, they're extremely dependent on exports. So if their number one consumer is at war with them, clearly we're going to stop buying from them. Um, they hold our debt and then they're going to start selling it off. It's just not in anyone's interest to go to war. I mean, the Soviets did not hold any debt from her. So they didn't have, they had nuclear weapons at our heads. So about oil in the Middle East. They definitely, they definitely had oil. I, I think you raise a very you know, important question because uh, uh, you know, the way Ch and it comes back to uh, comments that Lu Yang had earlier also and uh, Professor uh, Masmanian had about how, how China is perceived. And this, um, uh, this, is, this is in a sense I think where we have to sort of advocate for rationality, you know, that um, Again, it comes back to my comments about uh, about responsible uh, use of the franchise to vote. Because I would I would I would challenge the premise. I, I think that what you say is true. You know that that many people do have this view. But I would challenge the premise that there's something antithetical to American values about the way uh, the Chinese government is is run. Um, you know, I look at the I look at the resu results. Actually, I look at I look at the results. I look at the fact that even over the course of my direct observations, so the time of my direct observations, and I'm a I'm a I love to read the history of the area. And if I take a, a hundred year view, it's this is amplified even more. But what I see very clearly with my own eyes is the average quality of life in China for the Chinese improving. I see it very clearly. And you know, I have, you know, 
uh, I see that. I, I ground my assessment of what kind of what kind of governance structures they have as opposed to sort of I ideology. And including things like freedom of speech. The fact is the range of conversation I have with uh, people in China, not just those who are here studying alongside you all, uh, us all, is, is the range of conversation I have with colleagues uh, both colleagues in the universities, with students who are, who are there, and with people whom I just sort of encounter sort of in day-to-day -day transactions in China. It's very broad, it's very wide open, it's very informed, well-informed. Uh, to think that, you know, there's this sort of uh, oppressive state. We had, we have murders going on around us here. I consider that to be oppressive state that you know the if if i think about what kind what is being delivered to its people you know whether one is better than the other i you know i don't say as i say i think there's much to be said for democracy but to take the the view and this is what i think is a danger in a time of election is that it's so easy for for those who want to get into office to point to china as a kind of a bugaboo and they have these alien values, these values that are antithetical to, the, to US values. That is so easy to do and it's so dangerous and the only thing that can stop us is us saying we're not going to vote for someone who uses that as a way of explaining why things are not the way we might want them to be here. Anybody else want to comment on this? Well, uh, just to go on with uh, what Dr. Heckler said, uh, okay, I think China is important uh, to United States. Not only, I mean, with all the debt, all the debt to United States owing to China, but also um, China is a huge market. As you say, you see Chinese people's living standards rising every day, and China is <coughs> become like for luxury goods, it has rise to be the top. <coughs> top market for luxury goods, uh, and also um, for, for uh, because I did, I did uh, some research into agriculture economics before. So for agriculture goods, um, China, uh, China, is, uh, China is now, is, I think in this year, it's the top importer for, of uh, United States agriculture goods. Uh, China, import 13 billion goods, uh, American goods this year, and uh, despite all the poisonous food or uh, contaminated food, and China only import, uh, export to, to United States 3 billion. So for agriculture goods, China is a large market for United States, made in the United States. And also, I think with the, with the lifestyle of Chinese to keep changing for luxury goods and for our manufactured goods, China is an important market for, uh, for, United States, for made in the United States. And also, I think there are also a lot of opportunities for China's money to invest in the in United States. Um, I did some research into Los Angeles FDI. So currently, uh, China is China, China is uh, the ninth uh, largest source for F of FDI for Los Angeles County. But however, China's the FDI from China uh, enjoys the the the, high, the the highest growth in recent years. So I think I mean. Um, we can we we cannot put China as scapegoat for the worsening <coughs> economic situation in the United States. We, I mean, can we approach China to a more pragmatic and conciliatory way? Like you say, wh how can we how can we cooperate to to improve the United States economy, and how can we the two <coughs> nations? benefit from this relationship. Carolyn, I saw you making notes here. Do you want to comment on that? Um, I mean, this is, I don't know how many IR um, students are in here. I love IR theory, so I'll just, uh, <laughs> just set that ego for a little bit. But I think um, the world is much different now than it was, and I'm talking as if I remember <laughs> what it was back in the Cold War days, which clearly I have no idea. Like, I don't know if that was there. but. Um, I think that when you think about um, approaches to policy, and particularly with diplomacy, um, the, it's not as if I, as the U.S., I will sit in my 
realist perspective where I see the world as this sort of zero-sum game. Everybody has something to win, and in, for, in order for me to win, someone has to lose. I am not stuck in that view. It's not, the world is not like that anymore. It's not a, a, a bipolar or unipolar world. It's a, definitely, I would contend that it's a multipolar world. I think nowadays when policymakers really think critically about how to approach China, they'll put on their realist shoes for just a moment and say, okay, if we interact with China in this way, in this adversarial way, what will the response be? Is it going to be more benefit or more cost for us? If I look at the perspective from the neoliberalist um, or liberal tradition and we say, okay, well, what would it look like to be more cooperative? What, would, what benefits then would I gain from um, a policy perspective from this approach, and so on and so forth. I think that there are areas of cooperation um, that are necessitated simply by what Josh said. There are certain things that we've become so interdependent with each other with, it no longer benefits us to look at China as this, you know, weird animal that is completely, just totally contradictory to our values. I don't think that we look at China that way anymore. However, there are other areas of policy where I think that it is a little bit more contentious. I think energy is one of them. Trade and um, economic policy is another. Where we still kind of spar with China in almost a, a competitor type of, uh, like more of like a competition. So I think that there are certain areas of policy where we need to be a little bit more firm because that's the way that we're playing the game right now. But in a majority of the other policy areas, there's definitely more cooperation now, and necessarily so. Let me open up. Other questions, comments? Yes, introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Danny. I'm a journalism major uh, with minor in IR. Um, I want to talk about, um, like, I know you mentioned a little bit about Africa, but, like, the situation in the Middle East with, like, Pakistan and how, like, China has so publicly supported Pakistan in, like, for a number of years, and, like, to the extent of maybe giving them like nuclear capabilities, like how do you think that will play out with like in the zero sum aspect that there's a limited amount of resources and like both US and China are fighting for that area? Sure. Um, so China has a very interesting, almost mixed method approach to responding to issues of security. Um, this morning I was just listening to BBC and there was an analysis on what um, countries on the Security Council are responding to the Syrian crisis and what their positions are. The quote that sort of hung in my mind was the fact that China has been almost non-existent in that discussion, for good reason, because China has a tendency to want to only be involved in things if it's absolutely necessary. Um, we see that with regard to their aid policy, they have a strict, we will not be involved in your domestic affairs policy, meaning we don't want to know what's going on in there, we just want to do business with you, and as long as business is good, we're going to be good. But with other critical security issues, particularly with Pakistan, and you know there are a number of other areas where I'm sure China is supportive, like I think North Korea is probably one of the biggest examples of this, where regionally, I think this is an area where we see China trying to come out the gate as a global power and maneuver a little bit politically. Let's see how far we can toe the line. Let's see how far we can push our policy until we come into like contact with the US. I don't think it's necessarily like they're trying to win a game, but I do think it's an exercise in how much China can begin pushing the bar and the envelope a little bit as a global power. A, a, a empirical physical example of this is when I think in the in this, this past summer, China announced or unveiled this huge aircraft carrier, which is I mean aircraft carrier that is a hard power, you know mechanism. We know that that has everything to do with their military power, um, and they said that their plan is to build 21 or so more by the year 2020 or something like that. I'm, I'm sure I made up that number, but they have plans for this. The only other country in the entire world that has that kind of capacity is the United States. So I think that, again, there's certain areas of policy where China will push a little bit to try and wield its power and flex its muscles, and other areas where it's gonna be like, uh, actually, I don't wanna touch that. So I think it's really just a sparring exercise. I'm not sure that it's something where China is trying to beat anybody. I think it's really just a test of how, where are we at right now with regard to how we can maneuver geopolitically. Back here. My name is Elias. I'm a journalist. I have a question for Nerman about Africa and please. China. My question is: you, you mentioned the increased presence in Africa, 
I noticed it on the ground a lot in Ethiopia. Some of the newest roads are made by the Chinese construction companies. Yeah. Do you think Africa is going to be the X factor as far as the the, com the competition between the U.S. and China, the so-called competition? And when do you think that it's going to boil over because it's really increasing, as you said, very rapidly? Well, that's a hard question. <laughs> I'm not. Uh, I would never. I wouldn't say that I'm an expert in this, but I've done enough research to know that I think. The U.S. is definitely overlooking China's influence in Africa. Um, one empirical way of looking at it is the number of high-level visits, um, and by high-level, you know, foreign dignitaries, whatever level, you know, ministry level, um, visits to China uh, to Africa. China has had a lot of high-level interaction with Africa, and have had so many diplomatic interactions in the past, um, I would say, four to five years. Um, in 2008, there was a, a a memorandum of cooperation with regard to economic development between um, China and Africa. A lot, because of those different agreements that have happened, both bilaterally and multilaterally with the African Union, you see that China is buying up huge proportions of really, really critical industries. So, for example, in Tanzania, I think China owns something like 70% of the telecommunications industry. So, I think that this is not something that has been discussed at length um, in terms of U.S. policy circles. In 2006, there was a report uh, commissioned by the CFR um, to really look at how to strategically approach Africa, and China was mentioned in that report. Um, it's called More Than Humanitarianism, and if you're interested, that would be a really good starting point to look at this issue. But I do think that the sparring will come, and I think it has specifically to do with resources, number one, and um, diplomatic uh, you know, maneuvering capacity. That, I think, is already happening, but with resources, it's hard to say. I think uh, Eleanor had a question, had a question here. question in front here? Oh, yeah. I have a question about And you are? Oh, my, uh, I'm Eleanor. I'm also an MBA student. And I have a question about, well, like, one thing always comes up at, like, presidential election is, like, how to spend, like, um, budget and, like, defense expenditures and stuff. So like uh, one thing that's really unique about like U.S. Um, military is that it's like its global pre presence, and we see that it's changing recently. Like how U.S. is um, uh, one of the bases in Europe is closing, and also China's um, growing military is like posing a threat, and also conflicts with Taiwan, North Korea, and like Japan's changing security policies and stuff. So like, where do you guys like see that? Uh, see like. U.S.'s military policy is going like, with like all these like different factors like cyber military, the cyber warfare, and I don't know. Do you have any like? It's a great question, actually. But let's see if anybody wants to take it on. Do we have any, Josh? Go yeah. Ahead, Josh. I mean, in terms of traditional military power and tactics, I feel that we've actually in the, over the last year the United States Navy has shifted their fleets uh, instead of it being 50-50 in the Pacific and the Atlantic that's now been shifted over to the uh, Asian side over in the Pacific. And clearly that's a part of that is to deal with what's going on in the Middle East because every time they keep having to send groups over there so it just makes sense to have them stationed over there. And also what's going on um, in the Pacific Rim countries. Um, in terms of any kind of like traditional conflict with them, I don't see that to be very likely. Uh, any kind of conflict with them would obviously have to be via either air or water because there's no way we're going to send a ground contact with a country that has a two, they have a reserve army of 250 million people because anyone who's under a certain, any male under a certain age is required to serve. So if, if something were to spark off, that's, those are just numbers we simply can't deal with. So it would simply be like a more uh, air, air supremacy campaign, and I just don't see anything like that happening. I don't think it's in anyone's interest to go down that road. If I could just, just respond, I think the, um, it, you know, it's an important, it's a very important question. I think that, uh, you know, the, the last decade and more of the U.S. and looking back longer, I mean, the, the you know, actually, who was it? Sun Tzu, the, the ancient, the ancient Chinese, the art of uh, the art of uh, the art of war. The the trick is in is in winning a battle with ev without having to deploy uh, forces. And I think that kind of brings us back full circle in many ways. That if we can learn to uh, develop uh, a kind a form of international engagement that works to the benefit of all the parties and makes makes them see it as in their interest to engage with us on issues such as energy security uh, in ways, because 
what is clear is it, it comes back to Professor Masmanian's question about who would you know who would voluntarily um, consume less. You know, the, as I, as I mentioned in response there, we will have to we we will have to uh, face additional scarcity, right? We will have to allocate scarce resources because as it, industrialization is a process that is intrinsically requires energy as resource and the rest of the world is industrializing. The US has already sort of bloomed in some ways through, back in the industrial revolution and other countries are now waiting their turn and they, they, they feel that they're fully justified in being able to industrialize and experience the same benefits of industrialization as we had. And that is going to any projections we look at show that the demand for energy resources is going to be enormous. And so how we allocate and the institution, the, the global structures we have for, for determining how we manage that scarcity is essential. And the default option is that of, of securing them through military means. And then that becomes, you know, that's I think the situation we want to avoid. And that's why I think this kind of discussion is so, is so positive. I'm watching the time. We have time for a couple more questions, possibly. Do we have any more burning questions from the, yes, sir? Yeah, I have a question also to relate to military power of China. In the recent 10 years, the, the military power in China has been increased rapidly, whether in terms of air force, naval, other land forces. And there has caused an imbalance between the Taiwan and the China mainland. So how does the United States Department of Defense respond to this, to this situation? Because the United States wants to seek the balance between Taiwan and the China mainland. But nowadays, China's military power has increased rapidly. So should the United States take some initiative to provide uh, military assistance to China, to the Taiwan, or seeking some other approaches to balance the power between the two regions? Another important issue. Yes. Any well, comments? the the sort of the guiding principle uh, for the past for, for the recent past decades has been the uh, strategic ambiguity that the U.S. has on this. Uh, in terms of how we might respond to anything there. But again, I think this is a case where working hard to avoid ever having to, to address this is, is important. But frankly speaking, I think there's the, the, the rise of China and the rising military uh, will, will it, it's, its rising force, its rising presence in the world is going to, in a sense, corner Taiwan increasingly, that Taiwan's ability to sort of engage the rest of the world and in a way it's going to have to come to terms in some way with China and, and in a way that can uh, both fulfill uh, Taiwan's, the, the aspirations of those who live in Taiwan and uh, those on the mainland. How that's going to come about, uh, I don't, uh, I, I can't foresee. But I, you know, that's, it's important. But let me just go down to, at least for our students, Joshua, any final comments? Um, I'd say uh, coming into November, the thing that we should really keep in mind is the national debt. I really, that's an important, it has so many implications beyond uh, our borders. I mean, I mean it have, we have our own issues to deal with domestically, but I think we need to keep in mind that we need to hold, like let's, as it has been mentioned, uh, democracy uh, is an obligation for politicians and for citizens. We have to keep them accountable. And I think it's important for us to keep in mind that we need to, we need to be listening to people that are going to tell us uh, what we need to hear and not what we want to hear. Because Very nobody, good. Wants to, um, nobody wants to decrease consumption and we have a, a history of profligacy, but that's really something that we need to focus on in the future. Very good. Lu Yang. Uh, there was a question. Here. No, we're we're going to skip by the questions okay. at this point. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I think what we missed today is that we talk about all the strategic plans for how to improve U U.S.-China policy uh, relationship. But what what we miss here is that how to how the two countries can cooperate in in terms of emergency response. Like for for this morning, two Chinese students were killed near U.S.A. I believe in terms of to respond this this emergency, China, the, the China government and also Department of uh, Ministry of Education and here also uh, the universities and also Homeland Security and also LAPD and will work together to, I mean, to in 
in NF to to I mean uh, to respond for emergency and also uh, to improve. I, I think the in the response to in this response process, the relationship between the two countries will improve. Like what we see in during the event in the event of 911, China and the United States find a new topic to work on, which is terrorism. So we each um, launch uh, the cooperation in the global uh, fight against the terrorism. So I think beside all the strategic part, uh, strategic plans that we can think of right now, so in terms of emergency, the two countries really see a lot to go to go together to work on. Very good, Carolyn. Um, I think that uh, with regard to the U.S. policy process, I think that um, one thing that kind of is not in our favor with regard to our relationship with China is the fact that. Um, a lot of American legislation and policy is done with, re, um, with perspective on past precedents. So we're not a very forward-thinking policy culture. We typically are more responsive and reactive. And I think um, with issues like our you know, geopolitical influence in Africa and other regions of the world that are, I think, really declining um, at you know, our expense and really rising with China, I think that the U.S. would benefit from being a little bit more forward-thinking about what it means to be losing out on the opportunities to influence um, in certain areas of the world that could very be very much become strategic regions of influence for us in the future. And I think uh, with regard to the, uh, you know, the White House, I think that this is something that is going to become an issue in the next few years. You know, the, uh, the moment of an election we can think of as an educable moment in our society and elsewhere. Uh, I only wish that I hope although I must say I'm not optimistic, that the conversation among the candidates for the presidency as it goes forward would have as rich and thoughtful mm -hmm. an exchange of information and opinions and questions as we've had in a, in a short hour today. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is my hope and I appreciate the, 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 the panel for being here and for the audience and please join me in thanking them for sharing their thoughts with us today. It really, it really is helpful.